Though there are rulers, presidents, kings, queens, God is the Lord of all life. God requires our faithfulness and our service. Come, let us worship the Lord who is always with us. Let us praise God who walks daily by our side. Amen.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you with praise and honor for you, our Creator. You are the one and only true God, and we are grateful to be in your house today and can worship freely. There are many here today who have concerns. There are some who are celebrating. There are some who are listening at home and have concerns. There are some who are looking for answers to questions of life, and some who just need to hear your voice for peace and comfort for the day. You say that we are your children and want a relationship with us, that you love us. So we lay our lives before you now as we each tell you what is going on in our minds and in our hearts, and also listen for your voice. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to teach us who you are and what you want from us. Thank you for Holy Scripture to give us wisdom. We also boldly thank you today for healing the sick and the suffering, for giving comfort to those who are grieving, for peace, clarity of vision, and wisdom for the confused and troubled for forgiving our inattention to the needs of others and for not sharing the gospel message when we had a chance. We thank you, Lord, for loving arms for the lonely, for loving us when we aren't very lovable, for giving us a beautiful earth in which to live, for so many things that we take for granted because we live in a free nation. I pray for blessings of safety and wisdom on Pastor Kelly and the leaders of our church, for our leaders in government, for our servicemen and women, for police, fire, and other first responders. I pray that you bless those in the health field with loving hands and sound minds as they minister to those who are ill in our hospitals and clinics. I pray for those who are making decisions regarding the coronavirus. I pray for those who are suffering because of loss of jobs or businesses destroyed by riots, fires, and no patrons due to slowdowns and shutdowns. I pray for the homeless that they might find food and shelter. I pray for the children who are learning to be educated in new ways and for the educators as they adjust to new ways of teaching. And Lord, I ask for blessings on this gathering of your children, that we all will have ears to hear and hearts to accept. Bless Richard as he shares the message this morning, and help us to hear and learn. Make us your ambassadors for peace and love to others, so that we might let others know that you are sovereign, you are the Alpha and the Omega, that through the life, death, and resurrection of our Savior Jesus, all who confess and ask can have forgiveness of sin because of your grace and mercy that brings new life to each of us. May we stay faithful to you, Lord, no matter what today or tomorrow brings. And now I thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture this morning is taken from Revelations, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I cancel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And sad to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years. 
Um, but after about eight years ago, my wife and I had a tragedy in the family. Anyway, my response to that was I stepped back from the church. I continued coming into the church every Sunday, sitting on the back row back there with my brother-in-law, Larry. Hey, Larry. <laughs> but as we said, in, when I was in Vietnam, they called it ghosting. I was there physically, but I wasn't there emotionally. I was basically just sitting back there, letting things go by. Over the years, Pastor Kelly has been trying to nudge me back in. And I know he's a person that can be real forceful, but for some reason with me, he was kind of easy about it, you know. Richard, you need to get back to, to doing what you were doing before with the church. Um, you know, a lot of people go through things and they don't let it ruin their lives. Anyway, um, so, um, I don't want to lose my train of thought here. But anyway, this is kind of my coming out party, so to speak. Uh, he's nudged me. He caught me in a moment of weakness. And he said, would you do this? And here I am. One thing I had mentioned to him was, in all the years I've been here, I had never heard a sermon out of Revelations. So, I thought, you know, I, I mentioned that to him. Maybe I can come up with a sermon out of Revelations. Now, normally I read through the New Testament about every three, three to four months. Lately, I've been skipping the book of Revelations. I get to Jude, and I start over again at Matthew. Because Revelations is one of those books, you know, that you wonder, well, what does this have to do with what's going on in my life? What does it have to do with what's going on today? Um, anyway, so I thought, well, I'll try this. And I, I've always been interested in the part of Revelation that you can apply to what you're doing in your life today. And these um, churches, and actually in these chapters before this, it talks about seven churches. All seven of the churches are in what is now known as Turkey. All of the churches have problems, and I imagine nowadays all the churches have problems. Um, some of the churches, um, you know, had problems with persecution, some of them with poverty, some of them had lost their first love, but all of them had problems. This church that they're talking about today had a specific problem that none of the other churches seems to have had. As they said in the scripture that you read, this church, first of all, was lukewarm. Now, as we all know, coffee is supposed to be hot, iced tea is supposed to be cold, that's it. Now, I know for the younger people, for some reason, they think coffee ought to have ice in it. You know, and you drink hot tea, you know, but who does that? Um, in this case, he said, and we're talking about Jesus, actually. If you, if you read earlier, you see that Jesus is actually the one that's talking in this vision. And Jesus said that he would spit them out of his mouth. Now, that's kind of, you know, that's a picture in your mind of him doing that. The King James Version actually uses the word spew. I will spew you out of my mouth. And I always think of spew, I think of the first time I tasted guacamole. <laughs> we, we had just come to California, this is back in the 50s, and, and my parents had come from Kansas, and there was all these new fruits and vegetables and all this stuff in California that you didn't have in the 50s in Kansas. And guacamole was a thing. And they tried to get us to eat it, and it was like, God, this stuff is awful. How could anybody eat this, you know? And I get the impression that's, that's what he's talking about. He wants it out of his mouth quickly. 
Now the other problem with this church, <clears throat> with this church, of course, is they're rich. Now a lot of people wouldn't see that as a problem. You know, you become a Christian, you say whatever prayer, you know, and, and God is supposed to take care of you and make you wealthy. But actually in the New Testament, when Jesus is talking, he's not all that thrilled about rich people. He talks about the difficulties in making it into the kingdom of heaven if you're wealthy. Now these people were wealthy, they had everything going for them. Um, you, could, you could see that they had become arrogant in their wealth. They no longer needed God. And of course, as, as they said at that one point, let's see, what does it say? It says they were wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind. Now to say that about rich, rich people, you would think, you know, that's the opposite of what they think of themselves. But anyway, the, in most of these, or in all of these seven churches, there's a solution. The solution to this is, in big letters, repent. God expected them to repent of this. And then he goes on to say, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Now you, you think, I've always seen this. My wife has a painting that she's drawn of this where Jesus is standing at the, at the heart door of a person, one person, asking to be let in. But you have to remember that this is about the seven churches. And you could also say, that Jesus is standing outside this particular church asking to be led into this church. Which is, a, which, like I said, is different from the traditional view. Years ago, and I mean a lot of years ago, when I was back in my 20s, I was, had the opportunity to go to Switzerland. And I visited some friends that I'd had from Bible college there and I talked them into taking me to a Swiss church. Down the street from them was this beautiful cathedral and it was still operating so I talked them into uh, taking me in there. Now I didn't speak Swiss German so I really didn't know what was going on but they tried to let me in, you know, uh, kind of interpret what was happening in the church. The first thing I noticed, even though it was a huge beautiful church, there was almost no one in the congregation. As soon as they got to the sermon, I kind of realized why. The sermon was social gospel and politics. There was no mention of Jesus. There was no mention of the movement of the Holy Spirit. There was virtually no mention of God. And of course, if you don't know what social gospel is, it was something that was popular with the clergy back. I don't know whether it still is now or not. Um, it was basically do good deeds, help society, make it to heaven. Now, of course, we believe differently than that. We believe in God's grace. We believe that, that there is nothing that we can personally do to get rid of the sins in our life that Jesus has to do that for us. If I was to speculate now, looking back on that church service, I would say that Jesus was on the outside of this church, knocking, wanting to be let in. But they weren't letting him in. Or at least, that's my perspective of it. So, what I briefly wanted to bring up was what responsibility do we have as Christians now, I'm not talking about just the pastor, but as Christians in the congregation to ask Jesus into our services. One thing I've always appreciated at this service is the ups and downs over the last 17, 18 years I've been here. Jesus has always been at the center of the services. It wasn't political, it wasn't all this other stuff that you could drag into it. Jesus is at the center of the service.
So the question is, what can I do to make sure, sitting on the back row back there with my brother-in-law, that Jesus is invited into the service? Now the first thing is strictly a personal thing. I like Leonard Skinner, I like ZZ Top, all the good music. My wife, on the other hand, likes the Golden Oldies. You know, and so when she's in the car, we're listening to the Golden Oldies. When I'm in the car by myself, it's more Skinner than ZZ Top. But I also like the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Now, if I'm on my way to church, should I be listening to ZZ Top or should I be listening to the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? What gets me in to an attitude of worship? Which is the whole idea we're here for. We're here to worship God. And of course, it's easy to say, well, probably Leonard Skinner doesn't do that for you. Um, and like I said, this is a personal thing. This is not the pastor's responsibility. This is my responsibility to show up with a sense of, I'm here to worship Jesus. I'm here to worship God. But other things can interfere. A few years ago, I was driving to church, and I had one of these crazy tourist drivers in front of me. I was running late, and it was like I couldn't get around him. I wanted to get up the road, get to church on time. And again, I don't know where these people from Iowa get their drivers. <laughs> St. Louis is almost as bad, but must be Cracker Jack's boxes or something that they get these. But the deal is that then I showed up at church and I was all in a frazzle, all upset, and you walk in, you're supposed to turn all that off and immediately get in the spirit of worship. Now, you know what I should have done. On the way, this guy's driving however they drive. And I should have just let it go, concentrated on where I was going and why I was going there. Everything in the church service is about worship. The music is about worship. Um, even the tithe and offerings are about worship. The, the one that gets me is the Lord's Prayer. We repeat it every week. I can just rattle it off. You know, forgive me my debts as I forgive those who are my debtors. Now that I can't rattle it off, so. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Anyway, in Luke 11, they have a little shortened version of that, and it says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, I don't know how many years I rattled that off in church without thinking about what I was saying. I mean, that's one of those subjects you could preach a whole sermon on that one subject, forgiving other people. When I walk into this service, I should have forgiven my neighbor arguing with me about the property line, the crazy person on the road as I'm driving in, whatever else is going on in my life, I should let that all go. Forgiveness. And sometimes I read some of the stuff in the Bible and I go, really? You know, at one point in, in Luke, Jesus is talking and he says, you should, you should loan money to your friends and family. But then he says, even sinners do that. Right? And I don't know how many people are here that have friends and family that can borrow money. You're just writing off. You're never going to get your money back, you know that. But then Jesus added, you should loan money to your enemy. And it's like, really? You know, without any expectation of getting it back, you should forgive that debt. When you're rattling off the Lord's Prayer, that's what you're talking about. When, when Jesus, when we became Christians, Jesus forgave us a huge debt of sin. The forgiveness that we can do is, is really kind of a small, small little deal. You know, 
I've heard of families that broke up over loaning $20. And, I mean, really foolish stuff like that. As Christians, we should not be like that. Anyway, um, the communion part in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, Paul says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Again, that's something for me to do. That's not the pastor. That's not the person at the front here. That's me. I should examine myself before I eat of the bread or drink of the cup. What I'm, I guess what I'm getting at here is we should be active. And I'm talking about me because I've for years been sitting back there again with my brother-in-law like a bump on a log letting things just pass by. What I'm getting at is it's my responsibility, responsibility of church members here to help the pastor out and invite Jesus into the service. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Richard, for that touching message, a good message. Just as a reminder, we have offering trays in the back by the rear doors of the sanctuary. And uh, we really are blessed with all the gifts that the Lord has given us. And we're going to give back to the Lord today. And we're thankful for that. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We present to you now our tithes and offerings. With them we worship you and give you our whole selves to you as well. Please take these offerings and us and use them for the glory of your kingdom. We pray that you will extend and multiply their reach and influence. We ask this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We stand in the Those in the center, please come forward, receive your communion cups, and then turn back to your seats uh, and sit. And everybody, stay seated, keep your cups, and we'll do our communion together at the end at my direction. We uh, come to this table in remembrance of a wonderful, loving act that our Lord Jesus Christ did for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, please remember that uh, He did this for the, not only the forgiveness of our sins, but for life everlasting. He gathered uh, that night, that last fatal night, that night that he was betrayed, and he gathered with his disciples around the table, and he took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, eat it in remembrance of me. In a like manner, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Drink this as often as you do it. In remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion time. We ask that you would draw each one of us into an ever closer relationship with you as we take this bread and wine. We do this in the remembrance of the blood of Jesus, which was shed for us, and that the Spirit be with us today and always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
process is <laughs> a good thing, but an enjoyable thing when we do. Um, thank you, Richard, for that good message that you gave us. Richard is going to join us in the back that you might, uh, as we leave, uh, thank you for the service. But out of an abundance of caution, please don't take hands or give hugs. Just words of love and welcome. Uh, Richard, that was a great message, and uh, I know that as the Lord has knocked at the door of this church, that uh, he has come in, and as he's knocked at our hearts, he has come in. And uh, just go out there and make a difference and share that love.